Well, thank you everyone for coming. Welcome to the US Institute of Peace, uh, which is a national nonpartisan independent institute founded by the US Congress in 1984 and dedicated to the proposition that a world without violent conflict is possible, practical, and essential for US and global security. Uh, my name is Ali Vergi. I'm a senior advisor here to the Africa program at USIP, and welcome to the second in our Ethiopia uh, discussion series. And also welcome to our online audience um, with the hashtag a changing Ethiopia. There's a lot going on in Ethiopia, as we all know, uh, with events every day unfolding uh, that have uh, significance. And I'm sure we're all eager to, to get to those events and to discuss them. But before we get to the here and now, we wanted to try and understand some of where things have come from Today we'll be discussing ethnic federalism. Where did it come from? What is it? What is this idea of ethnic federalism? And where is it going? Um, some of us have heard and are following the situation in Sidama, in the southern part of Ethiopia, and uh, some of the issues there. There's also been the, the recent uh, assassinations in the Amhara region. So this is a time where clearly the ethnic federal model is being questioned by a lot of Ethiopians and by uh, people who are following Ethiopia. So we hope to get into some of those issues today and hopefully remove some of the mystery as well of what this concept is and how it's expressed and how it uh, plays out in everyday life. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, today's panel. Uh, today, sitting to my uh, immediate left is uh, Dr. Johannes Gadamu, who is a lecturer in political science at Georgia Gwinnett College, just outside of Atlanta. Uh, and a commentator on political issues about the, the Horn of Africa. Johannes uh, wrote his dissertation on ethnic federalism and the authoritarian survival in Ethiopia, so there's probably no one better qualified to, to speak to uh, the subject today. Uh, and he's a frequent commentator and scholar of Ethiopian politics and will also be speaking later today at USIP about the Gulf dimensions of involvement in the Horn of Africa and in Ethiopia. Uh, to his left uh, is Dr. Daniel Maines, who also has an Atlanta connection, uh, who finished his PhD at Emory, uh, and is now Associate Professor of Anthropology and African Studies at the Honors College of the University of Oklahoma, just outside of Oklahoma City. Uh, his research uh, explores the intersection between uh, culture and economics in urban Africa, and he's the author of Hope is Cut, Youth, Unemployment, and the Future in Urban Ethiopia. Uh, and has also spent a lot of time in uh, Awasa in the southern region, which we'll uh, get to talk about a bit later. Uh, and then finally, uh, to my right, is uh, Alamayu Fantao Wadamariam, uh, who was formerly a national peace advisor to Ethiopia's Ministry of Federal Affairs back in 2011, and was a scholar in residence at the Lyndon Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. And he's also taught at a number of other universities in both Ethiopia and the US. So thank you, gentlemen, all for uh, joining us today. Um, for the format, we are on the record and uh, webcasting live. I'll try and moderate a conversation uh, between our um, discussants here for the next hour or so, and then we'll turn to some questions and answers uh, from the audience. So ethnic federalism, this is a term we hear a lot. You talk to people about Ethiopia, and they say, ethnic federalism this, ethnic federalism that. Um, Johannes, I want to put the first question to you, something definitional. When we hear this term, ethnic federalism, and that Ethiopia is ethnically federal, what does this mean from a constitutional, from a legal point of view? I mean, what does the term actually mean? What does Ethiopia's constitution actually say? Can we remove some of this mystery of what ethnic federalism actually is. For those of us who are perhaps less familiar with this different federal model, and we think about federations in terms of the United States or Canada or an, an African federation like Nigeria, what is ethnic federalism? Can we start there? Thank you so much, uh, Ali. I uh, appreciated the invitation, um, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, ethnic federalism, um, you know, we call Ethiopia's federalism ethnic federalism, but some may uh, call it, um, um, you know, ethno-national federation. Uh, some may call it uh, with different names, uh, but I think ethnic federalism is a name uh, more or less suited um, 
for the kind of federal design that is uh, in Ethiopia today. Uh, the Constitution um, explains that um, the, federal, the federal arrangement is uh, created based on settlement patterns, um, ethnicity, and uh, linguistic uh, classifications as um, uh, you know, the, the main uh, or major uh, you know, ways that the government tried to create this uh, uh, federal design. And uh, why um, we call it ethnic federalism uh, is uh, because, uh, one, uh, the government calls it ethnic federalism. Um, uh, I once, um, you know, when I was uh, writing my dissertation a few years ago, I, I met someone who was uh, somehow close to the prime minister, um, and the prime minister, uh, the late prime minister, Malazinawi, actually also calls it ethnic federalism. Even though today some may uh, uh, disagree with uh, that, 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 that name. But why it came uh, to be that way? Why Ethiopia opted to actually form its federal arrangement in that way is uh, because of the, 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 the narratives that were uh, championed uh, by those groups who actually were. Uh, able to conquer political power in 1991. So Johannes, before we get into the history, because mm -hmm. we'll get there in a moment, mm -hmm. and that, that is important to understand where this concept has mm -hmm. come from, but mm -hmm. can we just sort of focus in on what does it actually mean? So when we mm -hmm. say, or at least on paper, mm -hmm. right, the, the expression of it may be different, but on paper, what does the Constitution say? What does it mean? The Constitution, uh, uh, you know, I would look at it in two ways. Uh, one is the federal constitution, Ethiopia's constitution. Right. Ethiopia's constitution says that uh, the government, right, and the constitution wants to empower uh, different et ethnic groups in Ethiopia. And the way to do that is by uh, granting them uh, uh, these self-administration uh, rights uh, along ethnic lines. That's one. Mm -hmm. uh, the second, uh, and uh, for me, is the most interesting part uh, of Ethiopia's you know, constitutional system is each and every regional state has its own uh, constitution. Uh, and each constitution of uh, any regional state, except I would say the Amhara regional state, uh, starts with this uh, notion that we, this group, this and this group of this region have been exploited, oppressed uh, by you know, uh, this old uh, you know, regimes, and now this constitution grants us our self-administrative rights, and we are these owners of this region. Um, so basically, ethnic federalism, right, for the, uh, you know, the old oppressed mm -hmm. uh, peoples of Ethiopia gives them this ownership of their own regional states. So it championed um, group rights, uh, uh, and of course, it, it, the Constitution uh, anywhere, in, nowhere says uh, it's against individual rights. But somehow, uh, when they emphasized and focused more on group rights, ultimately it has costed quite a lot when it comes to individual rights. Okay. But that's just the concept right. in a nutshell. I All would. right. We'll come back to the history in a moment. Yeah. Alamayo, let me ask you the same question. So when <coughs> we talk about ethnic federalism, from a definitional point of view, I mean, what does it mean? Can you, can you add to that from your legal background? Um, I will be very straight. <laughs> I'll cut to the chase. What's ethnic about Ethiopia's federation? Because ethnicity is the organizing principle of the Ethiopian state. Okay. So take a look at the preamble of the constitution. It begins with the words, with the phrase, we, the nations, nationalities, and the peoples of Ethiopia. These are the authors of the constitution. This, this construct, yeah. And one thing very important to note here is that the constitution, in its definition of nations, nationalities, and peoples, mm -hmm. doesn't slice and dice mm -hmm. who nations, who the nationalities, and who the people are. It's just a generic reference to any group that's, that shares a language, 
a culture, a psychological makeup, and a contiguous territory. So those are some definitions, right? Because this, yeah. this is Article so, 39 we're talking exactly. about. And it so, says, so, so, it's the, yeah. so, so we have the preamble, yeah. which makes explicit who the authors of the Constitution are. Mm -hmm. You have Article 8, yeah. very important, which is the sovereignty clause of the Constitution. Right. Sovereignty is based with the nations, nationalities, and peoples. Mm -hmm. Then what do you have? You have an ethnic constitution. You have an, an ethnic uh, federation. <clears throat> So to, to be specific about what Article 39 says here about nationality, it does yes. define nationality, right? It says yes. a group of people who have or share a large measure of a common culture or similar customs, mutual intelligibility yeah. of language, belief in a common or related identities, a common psychological makeup, and an identifiable predominantly contiguous territory. territory. So that's, that's the constitutional starting point, yes. but then from that we have the nine ethnic regions. regions of Ethiopia. So can you explain how this concept as it's been outlined in the constitution, how does it actually manifest itself yeah. in Ethiopia? So actually Article 39 uh, is a carryover from the Transitional uh, Governments Charter. Yeah, this is uh, before 1995. Yes. yes. So when uh, the the federative arrangement, when uh, uh, in 1991, EPRDF took over yeah. Addis and they commissioned a body to draft the constitution, mm -hmm. uh, a 29 member uh, uh, commission, uh, headed by the late Cleo uh, Rajo, uh, a prominent, actually, a prominent liberal, <coughs> liberal democrat, I would say, uh, which also includes the present uh, president of the Supreme Court of uh, Ethiopia, Maza Shinafi. Uh, they drafted the constitution. They submitted the constitution to the, uh, the Council of uh, Representatives. Then it was adopted by uh, the Constituent Assembly. So, so, so when, they, when, when they took over power in 1991, they, had, they, they convened the July Conference uh, on peace where uh, various groups, political groups and also rebel movement is uh, the ones that played the key part in the uh, drafting of the of this founding the, the founding document which is the which is the charter uh, where actually the rebel movement is uh, which is actually a misunderstanding to say that it was, uh, it was only dictated by EPRDF because the OLF was also part of that uh, initial uh, exercise so it left at, at, at a later stage, uh, disgruntled by the number of seats that it was that it was given in the in, in the legislature. Uh, so am, am I getting lost in the details or maybe or? maybe let's try let's try and let's try and zoom out a bit okay. so to say you know how before we get back into the history because there yes. is it is complicated a lot happened. So what you said was that what we have today is a carryover from yes. the pre. 1995 constitutional arrangement. So what does ethnic federalism look like in Ethiopia yes. today? So ethnic, what ethnic federalism did in the charter and the proclamation that founded the regional states, I mm -hmm. think it was proclamation six of 1992, is it established 14 regional states. Right. More than what Not we nine. have today. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Then when it comes to the <coughs> constitutional stage, yeah. uh, it amalgamated five of the regional states that we now call Southern Nations, Nationalities, and People's right. Regional States, mm -hmm. regions seven to 11, mm -hmm. were merged together to form SNNPR. Now, the question is, why is it that these regional states uh, were uh, merged together while the others kept? And is it really consistent with the organizing principle of the Constitution, where ethnicities are the authors of the Constitution. Right. Well, they did that actually for practical reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and a solution to this problem was put in Article 47, where any group which wants, wishes to establish its own state yeah. can demand for a statehood. Right. So this is what we are witnessing today in the South with the Sidama, with the Wulaita, yeah. and 11, and we'll altogether 11 the other South groups. Moment, yeah. mm -hmm. so, that's how the regional states were formed. So you have a list of the nine regional states and one city, actually, not two cities, 
Dreda isn't recognized in the Constitution. It's not established as an, as an autonomous state as part of the federation in good standing. It was made a federal state later on by a grant of a charter to make it an autonomous city right. accountable directly to the federal government, mm -hmm. but not a part of, like, it's, it's not in good standing as Addis Ababa, Addis yeah. Ababa legally speaking. Okay. So if we're to summarize, and Johannes, if I can come back to you, we have an Ethiopia today where there are nine ethnically based federal states. We have the capital, Addis Ababa. We have Dirdar under a charter. And we have these provisions in the Constitution where you can have an ethnic region that has the right up to secession uh, that's constitutionally provided. It has happened, if we look at uh, what has happened with uh, Eritrea, right? There was a secession. Uh, so broadly speaking, this is the constitutional framework. Now, Alamayo has given us some of the background of what happened in that period between the end of the Derg regime, 1991, and the takeover of the EPRDF, and what happened prior to the adoption of the 1995 constitution. But what I want to ask you is, where does this idea of ethnic federalism come from? And what are its intellectual and historical roots? Because, yes, we can say that's what's there, it's what's written on paper, it's what is implemented to an extent in Ethiopia, although we can uh, differ perhaps on the extent of its implementation, as you just pointed out. Um, but where, where does this idea come from? Can you help orient us a little bit to, to its origins? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, those who actually came up with the system, I think they are geniuses. Um, uh, uh, I'm not saying that in a good way. Uh, you know, federalism is a good thing. We know it works, right, in so many different countries. And uh, we have it here um, working just, just fine, just great, actually. Uh, but in the United States, just to give you some kind of perspective, uh, in the United States, we do have, um, you know, certain important democratic principles, like uh, republicanism or uh, popular sovereignty, uh, great ideas in, such, such as uh, separation of power and checks and balances. And federalism just happened to be one of these democratic principles because it's a result of uh, that democratic compromise uh, we had in the 1780s, right? Um, we had this experiment with uh, somehow close to unitary state under the British rule, then we have that confederal uh, structure and the compromise happened to be federalism. In Ethiopia, it's not like that. It's not a compromise. Uh, it's not, let's just try something new. Ethiopia's politics uh, since 1991 is not Ethiopia's politics. It is EPRDF's politics. And EPRDF's politics has always been about political survival. So when in 1991 they came up with this ethnic federal arrangement, when, even though- Where did they come up with it from? I mean, even if we talk about the mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. 1991 period as being dominated by the EPRDF, mm -hmm. where did this idea originate from? I mean, it didn't just come from nowhere. Mm -hmm. There is this uh, assertion that I do not fully buy in uh, mm -hmm. that assertion, but there is this uh, socialist uh, Albanian uh, kind of principles that they may have inherited some of these ideas of, say, promoting group rights. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's just one. But federalism has always been out there. And federal uh, arrangements can be constructed along different, different lines. Uh, probably we can come up with up to 70, 80, if, we ca if I can quote William Riker, even though we just have only less than 30 federal states worldwide. So the whole idea was just about uh, establishing regional status in, in a way that uh, you, you could use to empower group rights. Yeah. And they did that successfully when it comes to arranging these ethnic federal st states. But there's just, just one other, uh, one major idea behind a PR Davis framers. That was to somehow uh, punish uh, certain groups and reward uh, certain, certain others. Uh, looking at history uh, very much closely is very, much imp is very important here. But suddenly what happened is um, in, in instead of actually empowering groups all across Ethiopia, 
it benefited certain groups, probably four major regional states that are directly administered by APRDF member political parties. APRDF is this coalition political party that has four part parties as its members. These parties administer four regional states, namely Tigray, Amhara, Oromia, and the southern uh, uh, region. All the other regions, five of the other regions, are administered by what the APRDF officials call affiliate political, APRDF affiliate political parties. <coughs> but what happened is that they call these five other regional states, like the Somalis, the Afars, the Gabelas, and the Gobe, the Ben Shangul Gumuz regions, they call them uh, developing regions, um, as if the other four are really developed. Um, and what created is a two-tier federal structure within the country. So those who are administered by APRDF member parties are the ones that are running the country, even though one political party like TPLF was very much dominant uh, in, in, in the past until like a few years ago. And now we have another party probably is taking the upper hand in the country. So the others that are just you know, out there. I mean, the Somali, the Somali uh, region, the Afar region and others that I mentioned are not really being treated uh, uh, the way they should be treated. So I think that's why some even uh, go in very much radical ways and call it apartheid because most of the minorities that this federal structure was uh, established to empower are actually being, uh, you know, really oppressed by the very, the very constitutional structure. Um, so uh, I, I think that in, in, in that regard, it did not really achieve its objective. But if I may add a couple of uh, points, because Alamayo raised uh, two important questions. The, the Constitution is all, uh, you know, for example, the Article 39, you know, which is really quite a carryover, yes, but it's just, did they forget uh, to uh, take it out after Eritrea succeeded and when they came up with this 1995 Constitution? I don't think so. But such clauses, uh, such articles are very, very, you know, important for us to look at because I think these are the kinds of articles that, uh, um, created uh, suspicion among others, distrust, um, distrust among political elites, regional states uh, administrators, and the people at large. Right. Um, so I don't think it's just a carryover by mistake, but it's just a purpose, pur purposely implanted seed that could unravel the Ethiopian state uh, at some point in the future. I, ho I hope that will not be the case. Though. So what you're pointing to is this, uh, the question that a lot of people uh, are asking today is whether ethnic federalism is in crisis. And before we get to that mm -hmm. point, let me bring in uh, Daniel Maines. Um, you've heard now, Daniel, what's been said about the origins, and of course it mm -hmm. is contested as well, this idea that perhaps it originated with more of a Soviet uh, Marxist interpretation of nationality. Uh, the other argument one can make is that uh, this is in some degree a response to a historical uh, phenomenon in Ethiopia of an uh, empire first and then uh, a military government that was very um, unitary and centralized. Um, but leaving aside the specifics of the explanation, what I want to ask you is first whether um, you agree with the characterization that you've heard so far, but I also want to bring in this question of youth. You've written and researched youth and as we all know Ethiopia today is a, is a very young country, certainly younger than all of us here on the panel. Uh, how does this intersect as a question? You've written something very interesting a few years ago about this idea that you know, youth aren't necessarily <coughs> conceived of, and when we talk about youth, you meant urban and male mm -hmm. uh, youth in particular, uh, are not necessarily conceived of in ethnic terms. They don't, they don't see themselves ethnically. Can you, can you explain that a little bit, what you were trying to get out in that argument as well? Sure. Um, I mean, just to, uh, I think I'm not going to uh, take issue with anything that's been said so far in terms of the history mm. of ethnic federalism. I would just emphasize, because I do my research in Jima, which is uh, in Oromia, just clo very close to the border with the Southern Nations, Nationalities, and Peoples regions, as well as in Hawassa, which is the capital of the Southern Nations, Nationalities, and Peoples region. And definitely from, <clears throat> from the perspectives of the um, 
Oromo people as well as many of the people in the South, this issue of empire is uh, very important in terms of understanding federalism and kind of a long-standing history of what people see as uh, exploitation, uh, loss of land, uh, forced domination uh, from the period of you know, the, the late 19th century, uh, continuing almost uh, to the present. So that is an important context uh, for understanding uh, ethnic federalism. And of course, the um, southern uh, region is the most diverse uh, region of Ethiopia as well, with uh, you know, a high number of uh, ethnic groups there as well. And most of those, all of those ethnic groups were essentially um, subjugated uh, by the North. And so ethnic federalism is partially a response to that history. Um, on the question of, of youth, I, I would maybe qualify that statement a little bit in saying that I, I don't argue that youth universally um, see themselves uh, outside of the lens of ethnicity. Rather, uh, particularly urban youth um, in Jima, where I did my research, Jima is a very diverse city, uh, similar also to Owasa, very diverse cities. Um, in terms of the way that they were organizing themselves uh, was not on the basis of ethnicity. You saw uh, highly uh, diverse groups. If I was to ask people what their parents' uh, ethnicity was, it could include people of Dauro, Oromo, Amhara, Tigra, Garage, um, Kafa, Yem, all hanging out to, with each other, all spending time with each other. Um, and so whereas their parents might have been more organized in terms of their uh, social networks on the basis of ethnicity, for many of these young people, well, that was not the case. And for many of them, the working language uh, within the cities uh, was Amharic as well, regardless of what the language that their parents would speak. And the common things that brought them together was often uh, economic struggles, um, issues of unemployment, uh, common interests in leisure activities, whether that's playing sports or uh, chewing a chat or a cot, which is common activity for uh, young people uh, in urban Ethiopia, especially Jima, uh, whereas ethnicity was not necessarily the major kind of fundamental dividing line among these, uh, these young people. Um, I think that youth is also important in terms of the, the politics, uh, state questions, just because of the power that young people have had, particularly within the past five years, um, beginning with the Aroma people's move, the Aroma movement, and then now with Sadama as well. Um, I can talk about that perhaps later when we get to that, but just like the, the, the youth as a political force that is rooted largely in um, in economic issues. So it may seem odd to say that ethnicity is not an important issue for youth given the major role that youth have had in all of these uh, ethnic movements. But that's something that's emerged recently and also I think that when I'm decoupling ethnicity from youth, that's largely in an urban environment right. as well. And, and just to stay with you for a moment, Daniel, yeah. I, we're, no one is suggesting that, so now I wasn't suggesting this yeah. is a universal finding, sure, we've got sure. to yeah, yeah. qualify that carefully. Yeah. But given that Ethiopia is rapidly urbanized, right, yeah. that its population is uh, also rapidly uh, becoming younger and increasing in size. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what is the implication of the fact that uh, this characteristic age mm -hmm. or profession or education or other dimensions of class or gender as well uh, can be decoupled from ethnicity? I mean, what's the implication of that for right this federal construct? Well, I mean, cities are very tricky for an ethnic, uh, ethnic federalism. And as, as my colleagues have pointed out, ethnic federalism is based on the idea that you can arrange a region around a very specific uh, ethnicity. Um, cities throughout Ethiopia don't work that way. Um, whereas the rural areas, in some cases, are quite homogenous, um, cities are, are not. Uh, they're highly diverse. And that's the reason why, um, at, one of the reasons why at Sababa and then later Jiridawa um, became kind of separate uh, federal cities. Um, but even if you look at other cities throughout the country, like Hawassa, like Jima, they are not dominated by a particular um, ethnicity. Um, and so it's very difficult then to put this highly diverse urban population into that package of a of the or say the Aroma region, or potentially, in the case of Awasa, into the uh, Sadama uh, region, where the population of the city doesn't necessarily match up with that region uh, as a whole, and particularly when you have a large number of people within the city that. Number one, perhaps don't um, identify with the region, uh, the ethnic group that governs the region. And perhaps, secondly, don't even identify with their parents' ethnicity. Many of the young people may even just identify simply as Ethiopian. Um, then that becomes tricky to, to fit those cities within the context of uh, ethnic federalism. And that's created. Um, well, we'll probably get to this later, but that's one of the reasons why uh, the 2005 elections 
urban areas went um, so much, uh, you know, almost entirely for the opposition was one of the key reasons was because of that kind of rough fit between diverse urban areas and with the policies of ethnic federalism. And then changes in urban policy since then have been partially a reaction to that uh, dynamic. Um, Alamaya, let me come back to you. So can I respond to the historical sure. question? Let me yeah. let me ask you something first, and then you can you can weave in your your answer. So okay. what we've just heard uh, from Daniel Maines is this idea that ethnicity, to some extent, can also be uh, mutable, right? It can change depending on the circumstances yes. and so on. And I yes. I don't think anyone would entirely disagree with that yes. concept. One of the things you've written uh, is that ethnicity in Ethiopia is a noble lie. Uh, which, by which you uh, mean that it's been a useful organizing principle, I think, if we can briefly summarize what you mean by that. But if yeah. it's a noble lie, or a lie at all, then what are the implications for it being a useful organizing principle okay. going forward? And okay. if you want to weave so, in your historical so, answer there as well. Okay, so to answer this question, I still have to go back to the historical question mm -hmm. that uh, uh, the two colleagues were responding to. The historical question has two parts, in my understanding. The first part is the question of the origin of ethnic federalism as a theoretical construct. Where does ethnic federalism as a theoretical construct come from? One question. Yes. The second part of that question, in my mind, is what factors prompted the emergence or the advent of ethnic federalism in Ethiopia? Two historical questions. The first is political theoretical. I will start by, by, by attempting to answer that question first. The history of ethnic federalism goes back to the history of the doctrine or the theory of self-determination. The origin is Soviet Union. Before Soviet Union, in the run-up to the revolution, there were intellectual debates around that issue. Most prominently were debates between Kotsky and Rosa Luxemburg and around self-determination. And uh, the most prominent theoretician of that doctrine was V.I. Leni. But the person who had the final say on that was Stalin, unfortunately. So if we can... But, so, yeah, but, so, so yeah. we need to disabuse Western mm -hmm. The Western audi audience here, because we are always biased against Soviet and Soviet staff. <laughs> Let's not forget that self-determination was made popular mm -hmm. by none other than Woodrow Wilson. And it made its way into the twin international, co the in the, the twin international human rights instruments of 1966. Article 1, ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Now, <laughs> we have this balanced view of right. the doctrine of self-determination. Let's turn to the second part of this political question, which is what made ethnic federalism tick in Ethiopia. Yeah. Well, ethnic federalism was a histor historical necessity. Why do I say that it was a historical necessity? It wasn't a luxury. I mean, it wasn't just, I mean, you had uh, those, those things and like, uh, let's settle down. You, you had this A, B, C, D options and let's settle down for A. No, you, you, there was no other option yeah. on the table. I mean, <laughs> it was a historic necessity. What was the history? We have to go back to the, the era that we call the era of princes where parts of Ethiopia called regions. We ha you had regional lotus. And the first person who tried to bring regionalism to an end, who tried to unify Ethiopia, just as in, in, in European history, we call this unification. Yeah, you have Bismarck in Germany, you have... Uh, right, I mean, let's... let's so, uh, yeah. so this was, the first was Theodore, mm -hmm. King Theodore, uh, uh, Theodore II. I mean, there is a brilliant study of this, his, this part of history, the unification process, uh, written by not a very academic historian, but he's the best historian ever. <clears throat> Teclis Adik Mokria, a three-volume study of Ethiopian history of unification. The first is As Etiodros in Ethiopia Andenat, which roughly translates as Emperor Johannes, Emperor Theodore, 
and the unification of Ethiopia or Ethiopian unity. The second in that installment is Emperor Johannes and the unification of Ethiopia. And the third and final in the installment is Emperor Menelik and the unification of Ethiopia. To me, the founder, the founding father of modern Ethiopia, the modern Ethiopian state is Emperor Menelik. We can, right. we can, we I can mean, agree. Uh, we can, we, are, we can yeah. disagree yeah. on this. I mean, yeah. we can fight over this. But, but let's, 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 so let's this is, yeah. So what happened is, in the unification process, in the empire building process, some call it nation building, but uh, I, I, I don't call it nation building, but because there, there, there isn't a single nation. Right. It's a nation of nationalities. Right. It's a nation of nations. Mm -hmm. I mean, using the word nation, I mean, loosely. So the, the unification process had these two aspects. One is modernizing the state, and another is uh, centralizing the state structure. It was brought to the modernization project and the centralization project was, uh, had further progress under Emperor Haile Selassie. The problem now is the central, that, central, that centralization process was taken to a breaking point right. so by, the, by the military. So if, I can just, sorry, if I can summarize what you're saying. So this when the PLF came in 1991. So what we're saying is, in some respect, ethnic federalism is a response to that centralization. Is that fair enough to say? Yes. So the question then for me to put to you is if that's a response to the centralization, but the basic problem or a basic problem here is that we talk about self-determination, it also implies that there is some certainty to that entity, right? That if ethnicity is changeable, if it isn't fixed, if by marrying somebody or having uh, you know, a parent that comes from one group or another, your ethnicity can change. Yeah. How do you reconcile the possibility of achieving that kind yeah. of self-determination? Yeah, so, so one thing that I forgot was like the progenitors, I mean, the main players were also ethnic-based liberation movements. Right. We, we should keep this Which in mind. Which is important, yeah. Now, to turn to your question. Mm. Um, yes, to my mind, Ethnicity is not something fixed, right. something unchanging. To me, ethnicity is a social, historical construct. Right. It's fluid, it's dynamic, it changes. Someone, I mean, if, if you have the luxury, the privilege to live through different regions, Long, long enough, like long enough to live long enough. W one person who might identify himself as Amhara might find himself on the other end, right. maybe a, a Tigray. <laughs> you know, if you ask me what I was growing up, where, where, I, was, where, where I was born and raised, well, that part of Ethiopia was a part of what was called during the Dirk, the World War Province, which now is part of Tigray. But if you ask me, like, I was a warlord, yeah? Yes, of course I was a warlord, yeah. Does it contradict with you as a Tigray? It doesn't. Why, why, why doesn't it contradict with that um, uh, perception of my identity? Because, you know, at home, I mean, <coughs> it's language, yeah, one of the criteria. At home, my, my parents speak native, they are Tigrayan native speakers. But, <laughs> while raising their children, they weren't talking to us in Tigrinya. I mean, we used to think like, Tigrinya is when our relatives come from the countryside. They speak Tigrinya, but we don't, we don't respond to them in Tigrinya, we respond to them in Amharic, and we say, ah, oh, this, this kid is spoiled. But the thing is, they understand, we, we mutually understand. Mm -hmm. So it was, I, it was like, the thing was, was about urbanization. Yeah. It, was, it was like a modern thing to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Speak America was a modern thing, because it was part of the modernization project of right. the past regions right. of Haile Selassie, of Menelik, of Johannes. Mm -hmm. It was it was Theodros who made Amharic the language of the court, the official language. Johannes Atigre himself made Amharic his court language, yes. an official language. You know, so the project was about empire building. But at least now on paper, but there this is was no state taken, language, yes, right? There yes. is no state language, even if Amharic is the lingua franca to some extent. Yeah. There is no state language. So you know, yeah. what you're describing is not necessarily 
what is constitutionally foreseen or provided for. Yeah, but let me let me ask and come back to you, Johannes. Um, I think you know there's a lot of complication to understanding this, and there are a lot of different dimensions to it. I think one of the useful ways that you've framed it to help us understand um, in what you've written as well is as a patron client relationship. Can you explain what you mean by that? I mean, who is the patron or the patrons in this? Who are the clients? How does that uh, analogy that we might be familiar with from other contexts uh, explain modern Ethiopia? Thanks. Um, I would uh, also touch on a couple of points that Alamayo discussed, uh, but uh, first let me just Please. Uh, address your question. Um, it, the ethnic federalism um, as uh, an institutional design uh, was or has been serving the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front as a framework to extend its lifespan. It is uh, an, a coalition uh, with uh, nothing but survi political survival ambitions. Um, and uh, for that to happen, even if such regional states were formed along ethnic lines. Even uh, although these regions uh, were, say, empowered with the self-administrative rights, uh, they were not, uh, uh, you know, in practical terms, uh, you know, um, self-administering, uh, administering, uh, I mean, you know, administering that 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 regional state. Um, in a state, for example. When Malazi Zainawi was uh, the prime minister, uh, each uh, regional state had advisory boards uh, or advisory offices, um, and some of the advisors assigned to each regional state's presidents were actually more powerful than the presidents of the regional states themselves. Uh, that was his way of uh, manipulating and maneuvering that federal structure. Um, and even though we do call it a federal structure or ethnic federal, federal arrangement, um, Ethiopia was very much centralized. So this comes uh, back to what you were saying as the two-tier model of federalism earlier, uh, right? I mean, in uh, some sense. In, in, in some sense, that's tied to that, but yeah. also as a whole. Right. Even the, 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 the first tier of federalism, yeah. you know, that belongs to, say, to the, the four regional states. Mm -hmm. Um, there, you, you have probably an individual who is very much loyal to the prime minister, uh, who is serving as an advisor to an Oromia pre president of Oromia. So, if this uh, federalism was uh, unequal or uneven, also, where where does the the client, where is the patron in this system? I mean, how does that map onto this explanation you're providing now? So, Ethiopia is a party state. When I say party state, it's just a very deep party state. Uh, that is also one reason that is really challenging the current reformist prime minister. I think he has some positive, you know, uh, he wants to do good, uh, but he's been uh, also, uh, you know, challenged by that, that deep state structure. So what you see is the, the government, the, the, the bureaucratic line is not only inefficient, but it was weakened by the, the very strong part, pol political party apparatus. So EPR is, you know, uh, headquarters uh, in Addis Ababa, uh, you know, has this power over the Amara Democratic Party's uh, office in Bahadar and vice versa. And what happens is that those elites at the center co-opt those at the regional states. And the regional states do not have this um, independence when it comes to proposing policies or implementing it the way they would like to implement it based on the needs of their regional states. But it's always uh, based on the, the, the interests of the elites at the center. So that's, there is a clear co co you know, uh, co-optation uh, mechanisms in play. And that ethnic federal arrangement made it very much possible for the elites at the center, right? These elites could be composed of these four political parties. Uh, that, of course, make up the, co the APRDF coalition. And they are able to co-opt, right, uh, those uh, uh, at the regional states, and that definitely uh, served as a framework for political survival. But here, one thing that I would like to add uh, and, and go back to also um, with what Alamayo said is, 
1991, as Alamayo said, uh, ethnic federalism is, you know, is a result of this historical necessity. Um, and there was no any other option. I agree, there was no any other option on, uh, you know, on the table. Uh, but it was just because the liberation movement is, that had this opportunity to seize political power in Ethiopia wanted to make sure that there is no any other option but ethnic federal arrangement. Again, one thing is, uh, one, one reason is because they wanted to punish some and reward others. But even those people, just to my, you know, you know disgust at times, who, those people they wanted to reward or empower are actually now the most oppressed. Right? The Somalis or the Afars or the Gambelas or the many minorities in the southern region, they are the ones that are very much oppressed. And it's, it's the fact that the EPR, Dave, or especially the, those who are uh, presenting themselves as the protectors of this, the federal arrangement today, especially uh, the, the Tigrayan ethno-nationalists and the Oromo ethno-nationalists, um, that, that is not true uh, if they are really championing group, if they are really saying they are championing group rights. Uh, one, in academic terms, you know, if you, it's just very clear that once you, you respect an individual's right, um, you know, it, it will be, it comes naturally that you will also respect groups, group rights. But at the same time, there's also one fact that they never ever entertain uh, any, any parity of politics when it comes to group rights. Especially when, if you go to the, any Amhara region like Gondar or Gojam or Tigray, uh, uh, Tigrayan region or any, any rural part of Oromia, anywhere in the country, you see that women are uh, the, the most oppressed members of the society who are suffering so much. Uh, you see children in their rights to education or um, you know, there's so many minorities who are being displaced uh, just for you know, state-led state infrastructure, infrastructure projects. There are so many issues that we can tie to group rights agenda so uh, that me, are not yeah, really working. So let me ask you this then. Mm. Is it that the ethnic federal model mm. is broken or is it that its implementation is problematic? I mean, this is the key question here. You said that the idea was the people who were oppressed should no longer be oppressed, and today they are. Mm -hmm. Is it because the model has not been implemented uh, correctly, mm -hmm. or is it there's something fundamentally defective about the model itself? Just briefly. It, let, let me just try to, you know, uh, as an academic, you know, it's, I, 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 I'm all about the truth and sure. just the facts, and I have to make sure that uh, whatever I say is very much balanced. Uh, one, it is defective, absolutely. It's just the worst ever institutional design that Ethiopia ever had. In fact, I would say that, you know, in what others call, including Alamayo, call the empire, there were better rights to the Ethiopian people than today. But today, again, is that a question of implementation no, or action? Because the rights are there under the constitution, you know, they're individual rights, as you said. The idea of protection exists. Everything starts with the intention. Mm -hmm. what, is, what did the, in, those who actually framed this ethnic, uh, you know, federal constitution want to do? What do they want to achieve? What they, they, what they aspired to achieve is nothing but political survival. And they wanted those who had the political power at the time wanted to present themselves as the arbiters, the, the, the ones who actually uh, you know, could, could keep Ethiopia together. Uh, so you know, when it comes to ethnic conflicts, right, there is this vast political science literature that ethnicity in and of itself may not cause ethnic conflict. But if as a certain minority group actually controls political power, it may actually cause the ethnic conflict. Today, what you have is Ethiopia, which is number one in terms of the size of IDPs, right? Political violence is rampant. Uh, we will talk about the Sidamas yeah. later. But the displacement is not, you know, I mean, 
many in Ethiopia actually mention Rwanda, okay, our fate will be just like that, our fate will be this worst cases of genocide. Yeah, but you know what? What if those displacees, those evictees actually refuse to be evicted? What would happen? Of course, genocide, nothing else. You know, if you have three million IDPs, uh, <laughs> I don't know, uh, you know, I think we are worse than Rwanda. And that is the, the issue of the defects of it in federalism. But when it comes to implementation as well, some within the ethno-nationalist camp, uh, uh, you know, they say that it is just the best possible solution that we have. It's just that it's not implemented. I agree with them mm -hmm. that it is not implemented well. That means these regions do not have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, self-administration capacities that they should have. They should have had if it was implemented correctly. In one hand. But the way they, 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 they actually explain it, however, is very much a different way. They want it because it is uh, conducive to their homogenization of these regional states. There is this project right now, when, just like uh, Daniel earlier said, right? In, in Hawassa, uh, you have this very much diverse urban citizenry, urban residents that do not really identify with the Sidama, which is the zonal administration that's in charge of that area. So what happens? Those Sidama ethno-nationalists want to make sure that the city becomes homogeneous in the long run, in, in, in the short run. That causes displacement. So when they say it should be implemented, right, uh, and implemented the way the constitution uh, uh, puts, puts it, they are not saying that, oh, we have this, po this, this political right to administer our service, and we should have it fully. It's not. It's just about homogenization. It's just about making sure that none Sidamas or none Oromos in Oromia or uh, other regions uh, are not uh, in any way you know, uh, able to exercise their political rights in those regions that they live okay. in. So uh, I, I, that's why I agreed in, right. in, in, in yeah. those uh, two questions. I know you have a view on the, the question of implementation versus uh, yeah. uh, design. design, and I'll come to you in a moment. But I want to come to Daniel Mains first, mm -hmm. uh, because one of the other dimensions uh, that uh, Johannes has just alluded to a bit earlier is infrastructure. And we could also perhaps uh, also think about federalism in fiscal terms and in terms of resources. But coming to infrastructure in particular, um, one of the interesting things I think we could uh, talk about a little bit are the unforeseen uh, implications or consequences of having a federal structure of this kind. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say a little bit about how infrastructure, and particularly roads uh, in this case, um, has also contributed to both the changing uh, Ethiopia in terms of how ethnic federalism has played out and how it's actually manifesting itself? Because, of course, since 1991, and particularly since uh, 2005, let's say, there has been a huge expansion of roads across the country, of investment in infrastructure. How is this affecting? It's not something we would necessarily think of as having ethnic dimensions. Can you explain sure, that? Sure, sure. Yeah, I can explain that. Um, I mean, I, I wonder if also, would, be, would it be helpful to maybe provide a little bit more background about the position of Hawassa? And we'll come to Hawassa in still, a moment, okay, but okay, I, I just yeah. want to get this Yeah, idea. of course, infrastructure yeah. is very important. I mean, I, I would argue, so uh, just a, a plug for my book that's coming out next month, it's all about infrastructure. It's called Under Construction, coming out with Duke University Press. And it's no coincidence that you have a, I think this looks like a photo of the train, uh, yes. the train yes. and probably connecting Diradawa to Addis, Djibouti, is that, yeah. Djibouti, yeah. So in, in some ways, Ethiopia, I think, within the past 10 to 15 years, could almost be defined as an infrastructural state. I mean, huge billions of dollars uh, going into dams, uh, going into uh, roads, going into telecommunications. Um, and this has implications for uh, ethnicity in a number of ways. Um, <clears throat> just for example, if you take the case of Awasa, Awasa uh, actually has a capital of the Southern uh, Nations Nationality People's Region, uh, some of the best infrastructure uh, that I've seen uh, in, compared to other uh, cities within uh, Ethiopia, excellent uh, road systems um, comparatively to other cities. And what that does is it becomes a form of distribution of resources. 
So when we think about um, ethnic federalism, ethnic federalism doesn't necessarily have any implications, on paper at least, for the way that resources are distributed. Right. But in practice, it often does shift that. And that's where a lot of the tensions come into play, is when resources themselves, like access to roads, like access to telecommunications, access to electricity, access to water, when those things become attached to ethnicity, then that creates a large amount of tension, particularly in an urban environment. So when you look at road construction, when roads are built in areas that, that benefit one ethnic group as opposed to another ethnic group, that's going to naturally cause uh, tensions to be uh, created. And that's something that's happened in the Owasa case, where new roads were explicitly um, built with the idea of, kind of benefiting the Sadama people for political reasons to kind of bring them back into uh, the EPRDF, to bring them back into the ruling party, bring them out of the opposition. On the other hand, uh, the construction of roads doesn't always uh, work out in the manner that's expected. There's a number of cases where <clears throat> it would appear that these new roads are perhaps going to benefit a particular ethnic group, but due to long-standing historical dynamics, it simply uh, doesn't work that way at all. And then you have cases like, if you go down further in the south, also within the southern region, where the, so for example, the Gibby Three Dam that's being built in, or actually the construction there is finished, uh, which has uh, impacted or destroyed the livelihoods of close to uh, 500,000 people, um, this becomes a different type of center-periphery uh, relationship. In this case, it's not, um, it's really the kind of the urban centers, the manufacturing, the wealth that is benefiting at the expense of the pastoralist people, the people who have relied on the, dam on the rivers there historically for uh, access to water, fishing, um, water for their livestock historically. So a different type of divide is created that's not necessarily along the lines of ethnicity, but more along the lines of um, pastoralist versus urban dwellers um, in terms of these kind of economic shifts. And so the dams, the roads themselves, create a large amount of displacement that doesn't always work along ethnic lines. Again, coming back to the case of Owasa, when new roads are built in the city center, the people that were living alongside those roads are displaced to the outskirts of the cities. This tends to be people who are already economically marginalized, people who are renting uh, property as opposed to owning property. Um, and this doesn't break down neatly along ethnic lines. Ethnicity has something to do with it, but it's also class lines as well. Um, most of, in my research, most of the people that were displaced um, to the outskirts of the city were um, single uh, women who were heads of households. So gender lines um, come into play here as well. And so I think that one of the things that infrastructure, thinking through infrastructure in order to understand uh, policies and the implications of ethnic federalism is it kind of takes us beyond just thinking about politics, difference, inequality in terms of ethnicity, and thinking about some of these other um, issues, whether it's the marginalization of people on the very peripheries, whether it's class-based, whether it's gender-based, that, that infrastructure interacts with that. And infrastructure, particularly in a state that is investing such huge amounts of money, I mean, I think Ethiopia right now is number three in the world in terms of the amount of public funds uh, per capita or per, as a percentage of GB, GDP that is invested into infrastructure. When such a huge amount of public funds are put into infrastructure, that becomes a way of trying to understand literally how inequality is concretized in the form of roads, in the form of uh, hydroelectric dams, other types of things. And then there's also the jobs that are created with that infrastructure that's highly important as well. And then that connects back to the um, this you have youth as sort of a potential for unrest as well, which becomes part of this political question. Right. So of course there are other dimensions to mm. how inequality is manifested or whether it's based on gender or class yeah. or occupation. But if we can think about the, the connections between uh, the federal model in Ethiopia and uh, economic development or infrastructural right. development mm. and come back to um, Awasa in particular, I mean, one of the things that you had said before uh, is that from the perspective of the EPRDF, uh, that the success of Awasa in terms of its economic success, its development and so on, uh, had legitimized, in their eyes at least, uh, the policies of ethnic federalism. That was a 2016 uh, sure, view, yeah. so mm -hmm. you know, we're we are free to, to adapt it since. But how, how, can, how can that be the case? I mean, how can you, can you explain that for us? How is it that the success of Awasa, which has become a much bigger place, mm. a much more developed place, yeah. the roads are better, infrastructure is better, et cetera, et cetera, how does that connect with 
this idea, which uh, predates Abiy Ahmed's coming to power, of course, right, right. Uh, but was there of legitimizing ethnic federalism as a model. Well, so, I mean, so in that paper, I argue, actually argue that so Awasit, Gedo Awasit, is oftentimes celebrated as the city of diversity, city of love. It's talked about, um, and one of the themes, the slogans of the PRDF is, is unity through diversity. Billboards everywhere in the town, and so the town becomes this kind of symbol of unity through diversity. But at the same time, I argue that the model of ethnic federalism necessarily destroys that diversity because it doesn't work well. The, the diverse city doesn't work well with the ethnic federal, federalist model. So Owasa is the capital of the uh, southern region, as I mentioned. It would be the capital of the uh, Sadama uh, region. Um, the Sadama have occupied, they're the largest ethnic group in the south in the southern uh, nation's nationalities. Uh, people's region. Um, Sadama are about four million people. That, they're the largest by population ethnic group. But Awasa historically um, is a new city. It um, was only founded in the 1950s and the population was not dominated by the Sadama people historically. If you go back 20, uh, 30 years ago, only around 10 percent of the population is, uh, was, was Sadama at that time. The vast majority of the population was either coming from the north, but many of the people from other groups in the south, like the Walaita, Kambata, Hadia people, but also from Amara, uh, Oromo, so highly diverse city. Um, then we've got to jump ahead uh, to the uh, to, in, and statehood, uh, advocating for statehood, has historically been an issue that Sadama, beginning with the um, coming of the PRDF, have advocated for. So we jump ahead then to the 2005 election when cities across Ethiopia supported the opposition. One of the ways that the EPRDF struggled to bring kind of cities back in to the party system and to support their party away from the opposition was to try to homogenize um, the population of the cities. So after the 2005 election, Owasa expanded its urban boundaries to bring in a larger portion of Sadama people. The people living around the city are Sadama, not the people actually in the city. So with that expansion of the boundaries, suddenly Sadama became the majority population within the city. The reason for that is because diverse cities don't necessarily work well with this um, ethnic federalist model, because it becomes a question of how do you represent that diversity. So once Awasa becomes a Sadama city, then it's a little bit easier to fit that into the ethnic federalist model. Um, so to go to your question, from a symbolic standpoint, the Owasa is this diverse city, works very well with the EPRDF rhetoric. From a practical standpoint, in terms of people's voting behavior, in terms of who they actually support, it did not work very well because of the lack of fit with, uh, with ethnic federalism. So there's been a very conscious attempt to make um, Owasa a Sadama city, whether that's through infrastructure to build roads, um, that connect with Sadama neighborhoods, whether that's through things like at Owasa University, where I worked for a year, where it's about giving positions to a Sadama people, whether it's through making all of the city administration Sadama. Um, this be, then by making the city more homogenous in that sense, the idea is that can then be connected with that ethnic uh, federalist uh, structure. And so the kind of the unity through diversity doesn't always fit so well with the actual ethnic federalism through, through practice. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk a bit more about Sidama. It's been in the news uh, recently, last week. Um, what exactly is going on there? Let's provide some, some, some background first. Uh, that on the 18th of July, 2018, so uh, just over a year ago, uh, the Sidama Council, the representatives of the zone, <coughs> tried to exercise their rights under the Constitution to move towards creating their own state, right? So this is what you were talking about earlier, that uh, the southern region is also very diverse. You would have Sidama coming out of the southern region and moving from their current status as a zone to a state, potentially, yeah. assuming the referendum uh, was held and voted in favor of that outcome. Yeah. That was what they were trying to achieve. Yeah. What, what has happened since that uh, request was made or that attempt to use that request under the Constitution was made? Can you? Can you explain to us a little bit about what's going on? Uh, OK. Uh, what does what the does Sidama people in the Southern Nations and Nationalities People's Regional State, let's call it SNNPR for short, such a marathon, like, <clears throat> is they demanded in accordance with Article 47 of the Constitution, right. sub-Article 3B, 
for statehood, independent state. And this happened more than a year ago now, a few days more than a year yeah. ago. And according to that constitutional provision, there is a schedule within which a year, mm -hmm. within which the regional state has to organize the state council, mm -hmm. has to organize a referendum on whether or not. They should become a state or not. Yes. yes. The request was submitted because, you know, I mean, the mandate, the constitutional mandate, the authority is falls within the state council. But because the state doesn't have the resources organizing posts, it was uh, it was the it was given to the national electoral uh, the NEBE yeah. mm -hmm. the election commission yes because it's the body that's in charge of polling whether it's elections national regional and local elections or State. referendum mm -hmm. referenda mm -hmm. so what happened was with abi coming to power in april and the new uh, head of the NEB appointed eight months ago, mm -hmm. they missed out on the deadline. They needed to move forward with it. They didn't organize a referendum. They didn't organize the constitutional deadline within the deadline. Yeah. Now, the question is: I don't have I don't have the answers for that. I mean, with certainty. Mm -hmm. But I can, I, can spe I can speculate. Why did they fail to organize the, the referendum within the daylight? One reason, I guess, is because Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed was giving them contradictory signaling, contradictory messaging. When you say they, because, when you say they you're talking about the Sidana people. Or who are you talking the about? The State Council. The State Council. The State mm -hmm. Council, the NABE. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because Abi came with this rhetoric of unity, of reforming the federal system itself. Yes. But again, after several months in office, he came out and said, the ethnic federal system is there to stay. That's not something negotiable. So maybe I saw they were waiting on him. What is he going to do about this? All right? Or maybe the regional council we are concerned about losing their power. I mean, you have a, a party, Septem, which is a member yeah. in good standing of the, the coalition, the APRF coalition. How are you going to maintain your seat in the parliament and ex officio, a, a kind of minister, yeah. supervising a certain government agency without, when you are like attacking your own party? There won't be, there won't be Septem anymore mm -hmm. if there is, if, C, if Sidama is going its own way, yeah. if Laita is going its own way, and all the 11 zones, zonal administrations that requested for statehood. So they kind of woke up some, some night, you know, some morning, they woke up and say, oh, where are we gonna go? I mean, with this kind of uh, demand, this proliferating at this, uh, at this rate, we need to put this thing on hold. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, that's, I think that's what's good. Now, Septem held an 11 day long meeting in Addis. Mm -hmm. I don't even know why they couldn't have their meeting in, in their own capital, but in they, Hawassa. They did. But whatever they did, yeah. they did in Addis. <laughs> and they came out with something very impenetrably, very dark. Really, I, I mean, it's easier for me to decode Aristotle's metaphysics than their statement. Uh, you can't make head or tail of it, you know? I mean, what? The parties stand on that? You cannot, you cannot figure it out from that statement alone. Then a few days, again, they convened in Hawassa, and they said, there is a study, they call it scientific, I don't know what scientific means in such, in, I mean, is that statistics? I mean, uh, these anyway, days, you know, yeah. you do something and you call yeah. it uh, scientific, uh, whatever they, they say. According to the panel of experts we convened and the study that uh, we commissioned, they came up with three options. The first is to keep the SNNPR Intact, as it is. So keep the region as it keep is. Keep the region as it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second? Uh, the second option is to split it into two or three, mm -hmm. but no more. Right. 
the third is for Sidama to hold a referendum. Yeah. So, but they are not answering the questions of the other. I mean, it's, yeah. it's only for Sidama. Yeah. But Sidama is the only one who has fulfilled the requirements yes. so far. So, so still, what they are signaling isn't clear. Mm -hmm. It's contradictory. What's, you know, the, what's the contradiction? The contradiction is because the NEBE said yeah. it's going to hold the elections, mm -hmm. the referendum, in five months. Right. Yeah? But the party in Hawassa is saying different. Yeah. You know? It's coming, it's coming through a back door and saying, like, it's taking back what's, what the Constitution is giving them in one hand and it's taking it in the other. But how is it a contradiction? I mean, the party doesn't decide, right? If you follow the Constitution, it, the constitutional right has been asserted they get the opportunity that, to have that will take us. This will take us to the question of the disconnect between the practice mm -hmm. and the design in the yeah. Constitution. So in practice, we have EPRDF, and the way the modus operandi so far yes. has been for EPRDF to run the nation, with the federation, as if it were a unitary state. Yeah. Because it's, it's one party. They belong to one coalition. They are also joined by the allies in the remaining five regional states. So it was easy for them. They have the dominance in, in the legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, they have the party apparatus. Yeah. yeah? So, so whatever the party is saying, you know, uh, is going okay. to hold, yeah. most likely. OK. Johannes, one of the consequences of the failure of the election board to hold the referendum as scheduled was that some of the organizers of the Sidama uh, state or some of the proponents of it said, we're going to declare our own state. Mm -hmm. Said we waited, uh, we tried to follow, and we're going to declare if they don't give us mm -hmm. our own state. That didn't ultimately happen, mm -hmm. uh, although it was threatened. Um, although the possibility of that happening in the future uh, still remains, I suppose. It hasn't, it's not precluded. Um, how do you see this situation in Awasa uh, and in Saddam in particular, uh, playing out. Because it's unclear whether the election board can hold this referendum for whatever reason, uh, or let's say there are doubts about whether it will move forward with doing so. Um, people have said we're not prepared to wait any longer. There has been violence as a result of the failure to hold the referendum on time or to move towards some negotiated settlement uh, of one kind or another. Mm -hmm. uh, so that risk remains. We've heard uh, as uh, Daniel Mainz has already said that Awasa has become a more exclusively Sidama city and wasn't necessarily historically so. So we have that, uh, that grievance now also over the status of Awasa the city, not only Sidama the zone, but what happens to Awasa the city, whether the state uh, government has to leave, if the southern nations uh, uh, changes. What is the implication, as, as some have argued as well, about this uh, possibility of, of a southern region unraveling or the dominoes uh, mm -hmm. sort of following that if it's first if it starts in the Sidama and then the Walaita and then the people from North Omo and so on and so on. Is that something that you see as a, as a risk? Is there something that can be done about it? How do you see things moving forward? Uh, thank you, Ali. It's a huge risk. Uh, I think if I could say, um, you know, Abi, um, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed was able to do, you know, few things really successfully. I think he was able to manage um, the recent debacle uh, associated with the Sidama really well. Um, he recognized that it's going to be a major threat uh, to the country, um, and uh, here is uh, here is how. Um, uh, as Alamayo mentioned, most of the, the, the points, especially associated with the National Electoral Board, yeah. but the National Electoral Board also sent a letter to uh, the SIDAMA, the committee that is uh, in charge of this statehood demand, asking them what's going to be the status of Hawassa. Right. Because uh, Hawassa is as a city, as yeah. a city yeah. is the capital city of the southern region. and. Uh, most of the uh, southern regions, you know, diverse ethnic groups or Ethiopians in the south have invested a lot uh, financially, emotionally, in so many different ways in that city. And that city happened to be the symbol of unity uh, in the south and, of course, to all Ethiopians. And when I think of the southern Ethiopian, I usually don't call it the southern nations, nationalities, peoples, region. I just call it southern Ethiopia. Um, and uh, it is just, uh, we call it Little Ethiopia. 
and if this ethnic federal arrangement is to work, yes, or if there is real desire, uh, positive desire to actually make it work, I think we need more of the southern Ethiopian kind of regions in Ethiopia, in the northern Ethiopia, you know, in the south, in the, in the western Ethiopia or the but eastern hang, Ethiopia. But hang on a second. I but mean, the, southern, the southern region is very diverse in terms of its composition, mm -hmm. and a lot of people would say that the Amhara region or the Oromo region, while there is, while there are minorities, they don't have the same 80 uh, group type composition that you find in the southern region. So how would that, how does that work to have more northern regions like the south? With the exception of few groups mm -hmm. uh, in Ethiopia, I would say mostly the Amharas, yeah. uh, followed by the Guragis, and then to Gure, I, I may be wrong in terms of how I rated them, mm -hmm. Um, which are these groups who actually live all across Ethiopia. Yes. Most Ethiopians, uh, most ethnic groups actually live in very much, uh, you know, um, uh, certain localities. So Sidamas are usually found in Sidamas. I have never, growing up in Gondar, uh, which is the Amhara region, yes. I have never met a Sidama uh, growing up, or, <laughs> uh, or very, very, very few, or almost. But Tigrayans, of course, quite a lot. You know, it's, there's uh, lots of Tigrayans in Gondar. Um, so, I think that um, uh, Abiy Ahmed uh, understood uh, the trait not only against Ethiopia as a state, but also a trait that is coming from ethno-nationalist campus against EPRDF's rule of Ethiopia. Because most ethno-nationalists, uh, I mean, uh, the TPLF, although it is within the EPRDF, um, there is this, I wouldn't call it disrespect, but the federal government can do much in Tigray today. Um, ODP, which is the Oromo Democratic Party, where the prime minister comes from, the prime minister cannot get probably anything that he wants in Oromia today. Uh, even though it is a party that he actually chose. So, the, the federal government at the center, or the central government in Ethiopia, is very much disconnected uh, from most other regions. And the, the, the federal government cannot actually send its police forces or military forces to actually control displacement and political violence all across the country. But one thing that they, uh, at least the way they want it, uh, one thing that happened uh, before the Sidama issue uh, is what happened in, in Jigjiga with the, the uh, a guy, Abdi Ile, uh, who actually uh, wanted to secede from Ethiopia. This is the Somali region. This is the Somali region. Um, and he, he put that on the table. And Abi uh, and uh, the, late, uh, uh, you know, the, the late military chief of staff acted decisively. And uh, that regional president is now in jail. And Abi actually, I, I raised this issue because Abi reminded the the group that is uh, you know uh, with, that is um, managing this Sidama state question. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you do not right uh, follow this constitutional guideline yes. and the government's guidance in terms of how to actually. Uh, handle the Sida Mastitude issue. And what you're referring to is if they've gone ahead and declared uh, their own. Exactly, because they wanted to, to you know, de declare in the J July 11, 2011, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. They wanted <clears throat> to declare that. And uh, he said, if you do so, what would happen to the Somali region would also uh, repeat, it, uh, repeat itself in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Sidama, because he knew that it was going to be a major threat against the sovereignty of the southern region yes. other in, in, in terms of its regional sovereignty, but also with huge ramifications, as Alamayo said, to EPRD, because the Southern Ethiopian People's Democratic Movement, SEPDM, uh, would, would be in a very much weaker position. And uh, the SEPDM, uh, with its leader, uh, Mufrayat, uh, uh, her name is Ms. Mufrayat, uh, She's the minister of the minister of peace. Is a major ally to uh, the prime minister, so uh, he recognized that part. But I would like just to add a couple of uh, points here. Just uh, maybe just one point. What is the you know the good thing about the decision by the government and the electoral the electoral board, which is really under a huge 
uh, you know, uh, pressure right now, the electoral board, uh, is because there are so many other things in different regions that should be on, uh, on the agenda. Today, they just postponed. Like a yeah. few hours ago, they postponed the, el the election in Addis Ababa and Redoa city councils as well. The local elections. Yeah, the local elections, because they are really under a huge pressure. Uh, what is really uh, you know, important is they, I think, have realized and understood uh, what is really behind the 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 ejeto, the a youth group that's behind uh, uh, the Sidama um, the Sidama statute question, which is using very much violent actors to 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 push its its, its agenda, and also the committee behind the statute question, is that just like uh, Daniel said earlier, there has been that homogenization project uh, in 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 the city in the city of Hawassa for a long time. But it's not complete. Right. But the ability of having your own regional state could actually facilitate that 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 agenda um, of creating a very homogeneous uh, Sidama state. Right. Because what happened um, uh, the day uh, the electoral board released that statement was so many uh, you know non-governmental organizations closed their offices, yeah. businesses were closed. Hawassa is a very beautiful city with so many resorts. The occupancy rate for the, their hotels and resorts is under 5%. And there's a lot of uh, huge economic strain. And many Nancy Damas started to leave the city. But how does, that, how does the state itself, how does the zone becoming a state mm -hmm. lead to the zone becoming more homogenous? Because outside of Hawassa, the city, the zone itself, yes, there may be some minorities, but it is predominantly Sidama, right? Mm -hmm. So becoming a state doesn't necessarily make it more homogenous. Exactly, it? exactly. It, it, ethnic federalism doesn't mean that at least we all understand and the government understands, but sometimes ethno-nationalists in, in any camp may not actually buy into the idea. Uh, ethnic federalism doesn't entitle each ethnic group its own state, right? If you assess a very small minority, it could be you know, it could have its own waradas, sort mm -hmm. of like a county or zonal administration. And as long as they are in charge of that zonal administration, they are basically administering, administrating themselves. But having a regional state would mean for them, yeah. right, having more say in national politics, mm -hmm. having uh, the bigger uh, slice of these national resources mm -hmm. and, and, and influence and the ability to also have create or establish new political alliances across ethnic lines yeah. uh, when it comes to engaging and moving forward with the national political uh, environment. But here is this also one major problem mm. that the government already understands. And we also in the academics or uh, in the media also definitely understand. That is, if the Sidama say, secedes from the southern regional state, yes. there will be an equally most populated, uh, also bigger uh, geographically uh, sized Gedio zone will be uh, basically uh, left out yeah. as an enclave, uh, 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 so still part of the southern region, but outside the state border, regional borders of the southern region. Right. That is it's a huge issue. Yeah. Yeah. And here is why. Yeah. The Gedius, right, mm -hmm. it's a minority ethnic group, yes. right? Minority in Ethiopian standards yes. of over 100 million people, but they're yes. just close to 2 million. Yes. Um, about 1 million of them, or close to 1 million of them, were displaced from Guji Oromia right. uh, because most of the Gedio zone is in the southern region. Mm -hmm. But Gedios, ethnic Gedios, also live okay. inside, inside Oromia yeah. on the other side. And over a million of them were displaced. Um, and until recently, the OLF, the group that returned from Eritrea after an invitation by the Prime Minister, was actually in charge of this, uh, uh, this, this, this zonal administration in, in Guji Oromo, uh, Oromia and was actually responsible for the displacement and also for, for preventing the return of the Gedios uh, uh, to uh, uh, where, you know, where, where they belong. So there is this huge dilemma. It, it will be a national catastrophe. It will be something that actually the Sidama issue, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. Sidama issue would definitely escalate uh, the tensions around that area, the ethnic tensions around that area. Violence could be uh, spiraling. Um, and definitely the issue of IDPs uh, that has now put Ethiopia, I mean, it's always, we are always in the, headline, in the international headlines, but the issue of I, 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 IDPs is one of the most devastating uh, and hurtful, really, 
uh, phenomena uh, about Ethiopia today. And uh, the Sidama issue, if they were able to succeed, would definitely um, be a blow to Ethiopian unity uh, and, of course, um, to the hope of the, the, the country in terms of how we actually move forward. Daniel Maines, do you share that concern about what may happen in the southern region? I mean, there is this argument that has been made by, by certain um, analysts and scholars that if you allow or if, if uh, Sidama is allowed to secede, then other uh, zones of the, of the region may follow. Is that a problem? Uh, for one question, I mean, there is this question of allowing, which I find interesting if it's constitutionally uh, an, an entitlement that is there. But beyond that, looking specifically at Sidama, um, if we can come back to that as well, what are the implications if this referendum or constitutional process isn't uh, followed? I mean, how do you see it playing out? Right, right. No, those are great questions. Um, I mean, and definitely. It's already begun with other ethnic groups. The Walaita uh, are due, you know, they, the policy is first you have to request it, and then there's a year to organize the referendum. So there's other groups that are already in the process of, of declaring their own state. Um, you know, it's difficult to say exactly how that would play out. But I think that one thing is very clear is that the kind of proliferation of states in this region has the potential to be highly negative when resource distribution is attached to those uh, particular states. So you can have different ethnic states, and I think that it's possible for that to work out in positive ways in terms of empowering the groups that live within those states. The problem is, is when the resources within those states are only distributed on the basis of ethnicity. So let me give an example that comes specifically from Owasa. So Owasa uh, has been in, in the news the past few years because it also hosts the largest industrial park, um, not only in Ethiopia, but in Africa, the Owasa Industrial Park. It potentially is a source of 60,000 jobs, debatable how valuable these jobs are since they only pay a dollar a day, which is also one of the problems that is aggravating the youth movements, um, but there are still jobs. Um, now, this is not something that I believe is mandated by the Constitution, but all of the recruitment for those jobs at the industrial park currently takes place within the southern nations and nationalities and people's region. Owasa's is just right on the border with Oromia. There's no reason why they couldn't recruit workers from the Aroma region to work in that industrial park. So this becomes a case where Economic resources in the form of jobs is concentrated within the particular regional state, not for constitutional reasons, but as sort of a favoritism for the people that live in that region. So what would happen if Sadama becomes its own state? Does that mean that all 60,000 potential jobs in that industrial park are only given to the Sadama people? Um, even though it's a diverse uh, group of people living in that area? If so, that's going to create extreme conflict. That's just one example. You could spin that off into a number of other areas, um, whether it's access to, res to um, jobs at the university, access to infrastructure, things like that. And so I believe that when ethnic federalism is compounded with this type of ethnic-based resource distribution, that then it is particularly contentious and has the potential to create a much higher degree of conflict, has a much higher, potential to create a much higher degree of instability. But it doesn't have to work that way. You can have a Sadama uh, state and still allow people from outside that state to work at the industrial park, for instance. Same with uh, the Hawassa University right. that's based at Hawassa. Or indeed any other uh, yeah, enterprise. It, exactly, like exactly. So I think it really comes, I think that you know, that's one of the ways where the negative potentials yeah. of ethnic federalism occurs is when it gets attached to redistribution, but that's not something that has to happen. Right. There, there can be ways around that, ways of intervening. That's not the way that ethnic federalism has to occur. It does seem to be increasingly going that direction, I would say, within the past 10 to 15 years focused more on a tool that allows local politicians to then redistribute uh, resources within their own ethnic group to kind of uh, build up their base, uh, maybe another form of kind of patron-client uh, relationship that has emerged, but that's not a necessary aspect of ethnic federalism. I guess if we're thinking about ethnic federalism in terms of the way it works in practice versus the way it works in theory, it doesn't have to be that way, but that is the way it's become increasingly in practice, and that's one of the reasons for tensions, and it's not, and it's also around land, a lot of the recent violence uh, within Owasa has been uh, people pushing, for example, the Walaita people, who are one of the largest groups in Owasa, attacked, pushed off their land. So access to land is, is another um, key area there as well. 
And there's an interesting counterpoint because, of course, historically, public sector employment drew people from other parts of Ethiopia True. to places yeah. like Owasa. Exactly. Let's, uh, let's take some questions uh, from the floor before coming back to you for final remarks. Uh, for the benefit of our online audience, uh, we'd like you to use the microphone, which Amy is about to uh, hand out. Uh, we can hear you, but we need to make sure our, our viewers can also hear you. So please uh, tell us who you are and ask a question. No questions. Someone must have a question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm Herman Cohen, former State Department official. Uh, the word oppressor was mentioned at the beginning. Uh, now, historically, the, you had an authoritarian regime under the empire and then under the Derg. Was the power concentrated in a particular ethnic elite, would you say? Okay, thanks. We'll take a couple uh, before turning back to the panel, if there are other questions. Is that a hand, uh, Mike? No. no? Okay. All right. Uh, Alamayo, let me ask you to respond to that question first. Uh, I think I have to be very theoretical here. Uh, three people, three big people I, I want to bring into the... That's not theoretical, that's real. <laughs> Hegel, that's real. Nietzsche, and John Ross. Okay. <laughs> Nietzsche, most important, is the one who discovered the historical sense. And, you know, Nietzsche has this book called uh, Untimely Meditations, and the second essay in that collection, of, in that, uh, collection of essays is called The Use and Disadvantage of History for Life. So, like I was saying earlier, Ethnic federalism was prompted by reasons of history as also by reasons of TI. That reason of history is that narrative of oppression, of it, the nation's national and what the, what the constitution calls the nation's national and peoples by a certain hegemonic as a group. <clears throat> now, the thing is, one of the defects of the constitution which needs remedy, uh, a remedy to be remedied is this. This excess of historicism, yeah. this excess of, you know, history has a blessing and a curse, and historical knowledge as well. So <laughs> it's time to shift gear. And, you know, and, uh, and for the hulls of the body politic called Ethiopia to move away from this excess historicism of oppression. So I don't want to put my finger on any ethnic group. Okay. Uh, I don't think the question is limited to ethnic groups, but uh, Johannes, how would uh, you respond to this question of the oppressor? The I, think, the oppressor. I think it's a, a very important question. Really, uh, you know, we should not ignore, uh, you know, such questions. Um, I agree with Alamayo uh, that history has its blessings, and it could be a curse sometimes. Uh, but history is different, you know, in the eyes of everyone and how we research it and the methodology and who writes it. Uh, the victor, right, those who lost, you know, it depends. Um, earlier, uh, Alamayo mentioned a, a very interesting example, uh, which I uh, highly appreciated. It was about Emperor Johannes, my namesake, <laughs> Emperor Johannes IV. So he was the one who, he's from Tigray, but he died fighting to liberate some parts of Gondor from the Dervush, uh, the, 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 the Iras Islamic radicals from uh, the Sudan. And he was also the one uh, who, uh, who, who came after Emperor Theodros and who, you know, made, uh, who decided to make Amharic the state language. Not because uh, he doesn't like Tigrinya, 
but because it is conducive to his uh, nation building or state building project. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to how we actually criticize Emperor Menelik uh, for making that, that language, we just make it all about Menelik and we forget all, as there are all our previous statesmen that we had. Uh, Mr. Cohen, I understand uh, uh, that uh, you, know, you had, uh, you know, as an, as, as an Africanist or as someone working for the State Department in charge of so many, uh, re, you know, important responsibilities, you have played your role uh, in conflict resolution or state building in so many different countries. But I think there is this one major, uh, you know, issue that, uh, you know, I have also followed uh, in some of your remarks. Uh, about recent political developments in Ethiopia, I think there is something that you actually got completely wrong. Ethiopian history of, uh, especially in contemporary times, is about political narratives. It's not about events or objective reality, but it's embedded on very much subjective, very much political uh, uh, narratives that pit one group against the other. Um, you know, if we, Mangusto Hailemariam was half Oromo, or more Oromo, even uh, based on some documents from American, American government documents, than an Amora. Haile Selassie had, uh, of course, some Oromo uh, lineage as well, right? And I am someone from Gondor, uh, and people may think that, okay, he's an Amora, so he's being defensive on this or that, but, you know, the reality is I do not know a name of a highest official from Gondor who served in the, in, in the um, you know, Derg regime or, or in the highest Lassie regime. Uh, in fact, the empire was authoritarian. Yes, I agree. The Derg, you say it is correct. Yes, it was authoritarian. But what about EPR Dev? Probably the most authoritarian uh, in, in modern times, in our, in our, in our history. Uh, and pretty much maybe anti-Ethiopian. But today, somehow, because the so-called unity camp in Ethiopia, those groups who actually advocate for Ethiopian unity, because they are more or less irrelevant because of the rise of ethno-nationalism, APR day suddenly looks like the moderate, the center, the choice. It, they have become an option. Um, if you ask it anyone in, you know, around 2005 or um, yeah, you know, after the advent of this, uh, the, the 21st century, you would say, APRDF is like no option, but now it's an option. In part, of course, uh, hugely thanks to Prime Minister Abiy Yamir's popularity uh, and that this understanding that he wants to do good, right? Although we see him that he is now a hostage of his own political party and the growing, and, uh, you know, uh, strings of Oromo nationalism, and which he had to rely if he wants to make sure that he wants to survive politically. One thing that uh, also uh, I would like to add is that Amara nationalism is, uh, uh, is not about going back to the past. If it's saying, say, going back to the past, actually it will be the most disastrous to the Amhara because the past was not good to the Amhara, to be, to be frank. But it is about the future. It's about preventing a systematic oppression that targeted the Amhara, especially after 1991. As I said, this ethnic federal arrangement, if it's about federalism, if it is about bringing government closer to the people, right, um, empowering groups, expanding these democratic principles and bestowing group rights, individual rights to, to everyone, that would be great. But as I said, it just came because they wanted some people or some group wanted to reward some and punish others. And okay. that is, uh, and just was one, one last point. Briefly. Bri briefly, okay. I'll, let me just do, uh, uh, yes, nationalism um, in and of itself just is bad. Whether you call it Amara nationalism or Amara nationalism or whichever ethnic group's nationalism in the Ethiopian uh, you know, politics, or Ethiopian nationalism. Nationalism is bad. But in, in Ethiopia, not, because we, not only because we do not understand what nationalism is all about, but we do not understand also our politics really well. 
and our politics is really, really bad. And it is APRDF's politics. And APRDF happened to be a group made of the ethno-nationalist political parts itself. So, um, yeah. OK. Um, so before we conclude, I want to put the, the bottom line question to all of you, which is, you know, we can debate how well ethnic federalism has been implemented, whether it's defective in design, or whether it's defective in implementation, or a combination thereof. Mm. But it is the constitutional disposition of the country today, and that's uh, how it remains. Yeah. Is ethnic federalism a viable solution in the long term for Ethiopia, beyond the immediacy of what's happening today or what happened last week, you know, as a sustainable model of governance, it's been the basis there of the Constitution for the last 25 years or so. Is it something that will be able to carry the country forward, Alamayo? Uh, unfortunately, to our dismay, yes, it is. Why? OK. Briefly, why? OK. Two things. Two things. I, I, because I, I just want to prevent people from misunderstanding me. Uh, I'm all for liberal democracy. There is no other option. And Fukuyama is right in his end of uh, history argument, which is Hegelian. It's a Hegelian point. That's not Fukuyama, actually. But ethnic federalism, whatever you call uh, other political arrangement is, are arrangement is that you craft to deal with the unfavorable conditions of your history. Countries burdened with that kind of history will need to craft such kind of arrangement is, federative arrangement is, to carry you through to the future. But the future is liberal democracy. Okay. Uh, Daniel. Ethnic federalism remains, as, a, mm -hmm. as we've just heard, as you know. Uh, what is a way, are there ways in which its approach or its modification might uh, overcome some of the challenges that have been identified, particularly in the southern region, if you want to sure. confine yourself to that? But feel free if you have a national perspective yeah. as well. No, I mean, I think, I, I think federalism is definitely a viable uh, model. Um, it can work, it, it, you know, in terms of its efficacy. I, I don't know if there's a better uh, model out there for um, governing the country. But there's a couple things. One I already touched on is when ethnic federalism is directly linked with distribution of resources that undermines the system. Right. This uh, second, which I haven't had a chance to talk about very much, is this issue of uh, youth, uh, particularly mm -hmm. youth as a powerful force um, that's po uh, political uh, political movements that are based in youth. So. You know, youth unemployment in Ethiopia, urban youth unemployment has historically, you know, when I was doing research in the early 2000s on the topic, it was around 50%. And when I'm talking about youth as well, that's not, this is, we're talking about ages like 18 to 40, for instance. Right. You can be 38 years old and still live with your parents right. and still be classified as a youth. Covenant that's a, youth. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is a very volatile population. And when you have a population like this that is desperate for accessing an income to build a family, to support to achieve these goals of becoming an adult, um, you know the term fendata is sometimes used in Amharic, literally, you know, translates as explosive. Uh, so when you have that, that makes it very difficult to have discussions about statehood when there's a large population of youth that are desperate for economic change and willing to, you know, to advocate for that in ways that are sometimes violent and to grab to sort of grab those uh, resources. So you can have a much more, I think relaxed, less tense conversation about ethnic federalism, about the uh, rights of states, when that population of youth in some ways is not uh, so militant. How do you get to that? Part of that is through the creation of jobs. I mean, the, the jobs that were created through infrastructural development, as well as the massive expansion of the university system in Ethiopia during the past 15 years, did, it was a small step towards alleviating some of that explosive tension. Um, the jobs at the Awasa Industrial Park do the opposite, because you're paying people a dollar a day, which is not enough to live in the context of a vibrant city uh, like Awasa. It creates another point of stress, another point of friction. So to the degree to which you can offer uh, economic development 
where we where youth are not seeing their own ethnicity as their only approach to getting ahead and improving their lives, that changes the discussions around ethnic federalism and it allows those discussions to kind of take that violent threat out of, of the out of, out of the discussion and gives more time, more patience. If this is not, I mean, to have a new state at the same time that uh, Prime Minister Abe has just come into power, dealing with all these other things, assassinations, deaths in his own family, a huge number of things, so a lot to handle in a short amount of time, then to have sort of a militant youth group also demanding uh, state rights, it's a lot to deal with at once. The degree to which you can slow that down depends on being able to offer people economic development. Of course, that's not going to have happen overnight. You can't expect patience from people that are living just you know day to day, hand to mouth. But I think that's one of the ways of making ethnic federalism viable is through economic development more Thanks. generally. Uh, Dr. Johannes Gadam, last word to you, briefly speaking. If ethnic federalism is here to stay, are there things? It's easy to point out the defects or the the limitations. It's easy to point out what hasn't been done well over the last uh, 25 years, but also today we can we can easily do that. Are there things that can be done to improve the situation? Are there things that can be done? Uh, we've heard some ideas from Daniel Maines just now. Are there other things that could be uh, done to either uh, make the system uh, more equal, or more fair, more equitable for all of Ethiopia's people? Sure. I corroborate to what um, Daniel said, uh, but also uh, I, I would say that in today's Ethiopian politics, it's, it's very, very difficult. Uh, to not see uh, federalism as the only uh, alternative. Uh, but um, federalism is good uh, because just federalism is going to work and it works uh, you know, everywhere. But ethnic federalism is not good. Uh, I think um, you know, we should not undermine or we should not you know, discount this idea of group rights, right? Yeah, but what to do and, about them? I mean, they're yeah. there, right? This is the question. Yeah, I think we need to consult. We need to have a more of more consolidated regions. Uh, in terms of, uh, we have to redesign regions a bit. We have to uh, make um, you know regions more heterogeneous uh, instead of just. Uh, you know, which which comes against this homogenization project. If we are actually to coexist and and live together, um, besides you know, uh, today I don't see I don't see any any group that advocates uh, a return to this unitary government structure. Mm -hmm. Not that unitary governments are bad. No, they are not. I mean, most of the, the countries in the world are unitary states. It's just that even in unitary states, power can be distributed heavily and we can have decentralization. But uh, today I think, uh, just like Daniel said, um, you know, uh, we just um, have to make sure that we differentiate between physical federalism and what this federal uh, arrangement in Ethiopia is designed, designed to accomplish because uh, everything else is not really working. And if we are to promote democracy, Right, and if democracy is going to grow and this is, that country becomes uh, a democratic state, I think we will also be able to uh, have the answers uh, for uh, most of our, our problems because federalism is not the answer; democracy is, and federalism then, you know, as a democratic compromise, could help us achieve uh, better governments at the central level or local government level. Please join me in thanking Daniel Maines, Johannes Gudamu, and uh, Alamayo Fantal Wethermaria for uh, their remarks today. Thanks. And thank you to all of you for coming.